morning, everyone. Great to be here and see a lot of you again from uh, the past week. been away. So, well, now I was asked to talk about a topic that is very uh, close to my heart, and this is the story of, in one sense, I, I call it the story of humanity. Now, we're all people, whatever our culture, our background, and we're all one family of the earth, and we have, in one sense, one big story. Of course, we know lots of different separate stories of all the different peoples and so on. And each of us also has a story. Each one of us is a story. It's very interesting. We were all a separate story. We call it our biography, but we are each a story. But humanity has a story. And it's a long journey, and you can see certain themes in it. And one of the wonderful things about the Waldorf curriculum is the way that when Rudolf Steiner gave his initial indications of the curriculum, he gave suggestions that each year level, as the child progressed through the school, there would be certain stories that the child would hear about. And these stories together make up one big story. So each of the separate year levels, all the different things that we hear at each year level, in one sense they are all like chapters of one big story, which is the story of humanity. And while we're living in our own individual cultures and peoples, we know our story. There is a much bigger story, which is the whole human story. And this is one of the key elements of a Waldorf education, is to start to build this world story, the story of humanity. And the story, as, as you'll know, those of you who are Waldorf teachers, the beginnings of the story that we start in class one, we start with fairy tales. And that's the standard, the mood of class one, as we spoke about last week, this is to do with the special mood of, of class one, the child at this very young age. And then we progress through each year level, there are themes, there are different kinds of stories that we tell at each year level. And one of the final stories in the very traditional wall of curriculum is the story, the European story of Faust. This is one of the, thing, the, the stories that are told in class 12. Now, it's a European story, but it's also a world story because it's something that speaks to the whole, to all of us. And each of these stories has a particular message. And so I frame my journey I call it from fairy tale to fast, so from the beginnings right up to where we get to in year 12. So what I'd like to take you through today is the, the stories that we tell as part of the main lesson journey and how each of these different stories reflect one part of the human experience, one part of, of one culture. Each culture has a particular way of understanding the world. Each culture has a particular view on the world. And one of the great themes is how this unfolds over time. So I might just begin and I'll take this through. Now I'll have to stand here on chain to this today because my little clicker is uh, somewhere else in my other suitcase. So I'm going to be standing right here. So I'm going to be taking you through <clears throat> a great period of time. And I always start with this little verse from very well known little piece of English poetry from William Blake, the English poet, which goes, you may know, a very beautiful piece, which is really about heightened consciousness. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And we have an hour and a half, but we're going to go a little bit back. A very long eternal journey. And so let's just look here. Oh, no, my heading, my heading didn't come up. So now we're looking at this. We're looking at two journeys. We all go on two journeys. There's the journey of the child. Each as we grow up, we go on a certain journey. And one of the great core aspects of all of education is to understand that as we grow up, our consciousness changes, our way of thinking changes. If I use the big word consciousness, I really simply mean how we think. And this is one of the 
key elements that we all have as human beings is we can think. You know, the animals, they, they kind of don't think as such. They have instincts, they act out of their body. But as human beings, we can think. And this is the great gift of humanity. We have a mind. And out of our mind, we create all the great cultures, the stories. Just think of all the things that come out of the human mind. But the human mind <coughs> changes. And we each change as we grow up. We start in a certain way, and we grow into the way we think as adults. And it's very important to really, this, this, you really can't understand education unless you understand this change in thinking. You know, part of the mainstream kind of assumes that children are like little adults. That they, they think like adults, but they're just small. And they don't know as much stuff as we do as adults. They're kind of, they're tiny and, and they're incompetent. They don't know stuff. And that education is simply about filling them up with all the information they need to be an adult. Like gather all the information, chop it up into bite-sized chunks and feed it to them on a daily basis, like a medicine. And they'll end up being competent adults. Um, world of Education, we take quite a different view that as we grow up, we, we, we grow into our adult way of thinking. We grow into it. And there are a series of stages on the way. And each stage, like a step, it's like a staircase. And each step has something that we need to learn. And when we've learned that, we move up to the next step. And we could say that these steps are very important to really live out fully, to really gain the most from. Because there's a reason why we go through these steps. That's why we have the steps. Otherwise we'd be born just like adults, but able to do things, but we don't. So we have to grow through these steps. So the child's journey is about learning in different ways and gradually becoming an adult. My, my key <coughs> way of demonstrating this is to say the, the past, to look at what you've all been doing for the past five minutes. Now, could you imagine a group of five-year-olds doing what you've just done for five minutes? Can you really imagine five-year-olds sitting very still, <laughs> listening to me, <laughs> talking at you? If I was telling a story, maybe they might listen, but I'm not telling a story. I'm giving you complex information. Uh, that, on its own, demonstrates what I'm saying. That the child has a different way of thinking. They just think in a different way. And their first form of learning, their first way of, of thinking almost, is a very particular one. They think through play. The child's first form of thinking about the world is through playing the world. They see something and they want to play it out. That's their first thing. So their first thing is to play. Now we did all this last week in great detail. So I'm just going to go over it very, very briefly. So our first form of learning in early childhood is through play. That's how we, that's how we think. We think about the world through play. We see a, we see a, a fire, you know, a bomber go down the street. And what do the children want to do? They want to play at being bomber. They want to actually be the fireman, right? They play it. So that's, they, they've seen something, they're thinking about it, they're, they do it with their body. So play is our first form. The second form is through, we start to imagine things. We start to make inner pictures. We went through this all last week in detail why this happens. So I'm just, I'm just summarizing what happens. So we now imagine, we think about the world through pictures, through stories. And this is really our primary school. Now, of course, there are many gradations, little, little steps on the way. And then in high school, something starts to happen around the age usually of 10 or 11. We start to separate out even more from the world, and we start to think about the world. We start to, instead of just playing, instead of just hearing a story, we start to ask, we start to see there are connections. One thing causes another. 
this thing here led to that over there. And we see the connections. Now we call this reason. This is being able to read the reasons behind things. Now, and then this is leads to us as adults, ideally, that we do things for reasons. We can think about the world. So these are steps that we've all gone through. This is our personal story. Each one of us, in different ways, has gone through this journey. From a child to an adult. We've gone through play, imagining, reasoning. Now that's one journey. That's the, we call that the, uh, that's the, the story of how we think as a child. We grow through that. That's the story of our thinking. How we've got, the reason you're sitting here listening to me is because you've done all of that. You're, you're sitting here thinking, once you would have been playing, once you would have heard a story, now you can sit here. So that's the story of your thinking. Now, the, uh, so we call this, this, so this is one of the journeys. So this is the, the child's journey into thinking. Now, we also have the other journey, which is the human journey. Because humanity overall has also gone on this journey. But it's big. It's over many cultures, it's over many parts of the world. But we've all gone on, it's that humanity overall has gone on this journey. Now because the world is very big and it's spread out, of course different peoples go through this at different times. But overall the world has moved on this journey. And across the world, because there are many different places, like vastly different, from South America to Europe to Australia, hugely different places, we go through it at different rates, at different times, at different speed. The, the different time, and so some go very fast, and some go slower. But each has a particular part to play in it. And new things come into this human story. And when new things come in, they have to start somewhere. They have to start in a, on a place on earth. So when each of these new steps that, uh, that we call, so I won't come to that, each of these new steps, as they come into the world story, the big human story, as they come into this human story, they come in at different times, but they start in different places. And then they spread. And they, they spread around the whole world. Now just think about how new things come into the world and then spread. So they start as one, the part of one people's story, and then they become part of the world story. Just think of just think of everyone. The world has just watched the World Cup, right? Soccer, football. Where was that ever a world? Was that did everyone have soccer originally? No. Where did soccer start? It started in England by some people kicking a ball around. It started as an English game. Countries like Brazil. It's now the national religion, soccer, football. <laughs> now I have a friend who's Brazilian and he says they know exactly the day that an Englishman came on a ship to Brazil with a football. They know exactly the day, it was March 23rd, 1878, or something like that. They know the day. He walked off the boat in Rio de Janeiro, kicked the ball, and suddenly the people thought, wow, this is great. And it's spread, and it's now, it's the national, like it's like their national religion, right? South America, they all play football. But they, it started, it started on one place, so it started in England. But do we think of it as now the English game? No, it's the world game, because it belongs to it. Same was, I was, I was just driving in the car with, with Grace the other day, and I'm listening on the radio to Louis Armstrong singing... 
piece from <coughs> Porgy and Biss, one of my favourite tracks. Now it's jazz. Oh, so here we are listening to jazz in Kuala Lumpur. You can hear jazz every country on earth. Where did jazz start? Did jazz start in Kuala Lumpur? No, it started in New Orleans. In one place in the US. It began in one place. And now it's spread. Think of basketball. Like been past many basketball courts here in Kuala Lumpur. Was basketball ever invented in Malaysia? No. It started in a college in Massachusetts, in North America, as a sport, then it spread. Every country in the world, you can find a basketball court. So in other words, things start somewhere, and then they become a world story. They don't belong to that place anymore. So we don't think of basketball now as an American sport, or soccer as an English sport, um, or jazz as just American. They are world, world things. Now, what I'm, the reason I'm saying this to you is what I'm going to talk about today is really our modern consciousness. The, what I call the, I'm going to the biggest level, the modern world consciousness that can solve this problem here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the modern technological, the modern technological consciousness, the modern thinking, the world thinking that now everyone, in a sense, shares around the world. But it started in one place. It started in one place. And so when we tell the story, <coughs> of how that thinking develops, it does come from one particular part of the world. And sometimes, uh, and, and the wall of curriculum, the, what I call the main lesson curriculum, does have, tell, tells this story. The main lesson curriculum tells the story of modern world thinking but it came out of one part of the world. So it's going to have a focus on that one part of the world. And so I'm going to tell, what I'm going to go through with you today is the, the different epochs, the different ways of thinking from different cultures that led to the modern world consciousness. And that's the world story. Now in the world of schools around the world, we always balance. Oh look, it's solved. Fantastic. Well done. That's, 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 uh, modern consciousness, isn't it? No, seriously. I'm both serious. Eh? That's, 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 that we think in a particular way now around the world. And <clears throat> the aim of the Waldorf curriculum is to help each child become a world citizen, a global citizen. But at the same time, we each have a personal local story. So we tell two stories in a Waldorf school. We tell a local story, and we must tell that, because we belong to a particular place. We have a family, we have a country. We need to feel grounded on earth. As uh, say, Ting yesterday talked so beautifully about the geography curriculum. She put it so perfectly, of just how we need to help the child love their place on earth. Perfect. Because then you feel at home. You have to feel at home on earth in your own community. But then as well, you, your community only makes sense in the world community. We are one family as well. And so our uh, schooling, we have to tell the two stories together. And that's, that's, that's the, the great, I call it the, the dance of all of education, is making sure you get those two in balance. You tell your local story, and you tell the world story. So what I'm going to tell today is take you through that world story, the story that led to modern consciousness, because it comes from a particular part of the world, which you will see what that is, and I'm sure you know who it is. So, so now this world story is, we call it in world of education, the golden thread. Like a thread that runs, you know, just as you have in, say, a very beautiful piece of Bartek or a very beautiful piece of uh, cloth. Sometimes they weave a golden thread through it, and it looks extra beautiful. Uh, makes lifts it up, so it's 
even higher quality. The world story we call the golden thread that runs through the Waldorf curriculum. And so each year of the Waldorf curriculum, there are stories told from particular cultures. And they add, each one adds something to the story. And it's like this golden thread weaves in and out. And of course, in between are all the local stories that tell you about your local place, your local history, your local geography, but then <coughs> build it into the world story. And this is, this is you know, the standard, usual way of describing this, the evolution of human consciousness, but which is a big kind of word. But as I always just think of it simply as the main lesson journey and the story of human thinking, just how we've grown. Just as the child has gone through play, imagining, reason, so humanity has gone through those stages as well. Now these stages, they in a sense they answer a question, because otherwise we can be there are so many stories, we can get lost in the stories. There are so many different things. If you look out at all the different cultures and stories, you'd think, what's the meaning of all this? And any smart young person often has this question, you know, well, what is it all about? Now, humanity has always asked this question, what's it all about? It's a very famous uh, European painting that I, that I like to this is by uh, the French artist Gauguin. Um, uh, Gauguin was a very famous French uh, Impressionist, but he got sick of Europe and he went to Tahiti. And he lived in Tahiti, and there he painted this rather strange painting, which no one quite knows what it's about. But up in the corner of the painting, up here in the corner there, there are some words written in French. And the words, it's just an example of how people have asked this question. And these words are in French, they say, Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? Now this is the basic question that everyone asks. And all you, and all humanity asks, where, where have we come from, how did we get to here, who are we, and where are we going? Now, my slide, this particular deck has just some things that I've done in other places. <laughs> I'm slightly embarrassed to say that the next photo is, uh, is about me, and <laughs> but I, I, I just, I'll, I'll go over it very quickly, but it was just the, um, I start the story by saying that all of the, the world's story starts with the people that we call First Nations people, Indigenous people, Aboriginal people. And so I tell the story of, as Athena said, I spent a year with the Oranasli in Johor. And I actually, uh, when I was first went into the, the village, into the forest in Johor, um, I was driven in by, by it's a long story, and I've gone in there various times, but when I went in for the, I was dropped off for the last time before I walked in, I had three guides who helped carry my gear, and this is the photo of me, age 22, going in. <laughs> <laughs> I have to explain where Malaysia is, so I you know, have a little map and, and so on. And these are, this was uh, just a few shots of the, uh, in the in the Utan. Uh, this was just like the houses that we lived in, very simple little uh, houses. And and, um, and this is how they, this is the Nyungpit, blow pipes and uh, catching, uh, catching monyet and, uh, and uh, 
So they call them lockdowns. And uh, they, this is the time when they actually cut down the forest. They still cut down the forest in those days. They chopped the forest, and uh, this was how they, they, they did it. So they clear the forest, and they actually, these big, massive trees, they used to, just with an axe. So one man and his two sons, they cleared this whole area just with three axes. Unbelievable. You know, now they go in with bulldozers and chainsaws and and this was how they talk about human will. This was uh, chopping, just cutting this tree down uh, just with one axe. They built a little stand and chopped it and then eventually it was there it actually went over. So that was the, the way of uh, But the thing that was most interesting was the, uh, the boyan, was the, the bomo. And this was... Uh, was, um, this was my adopted, adopted he was my uh, Baba Anka, um, and uh, this was uh, in, in uh, Banyami, the Ubat, what they now call the Ubatan Boranasri. And so this was the, uh, where they would, they would go on a journey, Atas, into the upper world. And then when, when uh, so that's another whole story. I can, I can tell you if you want to know. I can do a whole, whole deck on, on them. But then they, and this was their, their uh, they had a healing ceremony where they made offerings to the Dato, with the, um, the kind of the, uh, they had, uh, what's the word, um, it's like a, a sacred site, special places where, in, in the forest, where they would make offerings to, to the, and, uh, and then there's just some shots of me at different times. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And then this is now when they, they have Ruma Batu, where they have Ruma uh, Batu. Uh, uh, so. uh, and then this is this is the this is the village now. Very different now. This is exactly right. So this is the change that's gone on to them, and that's um, I, and this is extraordinary because when I was there, of course, there was no communication with the outside world, nothing. But now look what they have now. I was there in 2007 when they, they brought the power poles came in, the electricity came in. And so immediately they, they're now connected to the World Wide Web. They have power. Now the extraordinary thing is in that time, in my lifetime, they have gone from living totally in the forest, totally isolated, to now within my lifetime they're now connected to the world. I mean they're on my you know they're on my phone and my, my WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in touch with them. So so they've gone in one lifetime, they've gone from this isolated in the forest, a bit like playing, to now they're part of the world. So they've gone this human journey very fast. So very fast within that very short time. They've, they've made the journey. So, and, but all humanity's made the journey. And it took a long, long time. And now everyone on the face of the earth is being brought into this world story. Everyone's being brought into this modern... Everyone is sharing this, you know, like, the, like all of us. We're all in it together today. But one, it had to happen somewhere first. And this is what the main lesson story is. is bringing people, to, telling to the child how this story, how modern thinking came about. But it did happen in one place, but now it's everywhere. So, so, so let's have a look. Now, the journey I'm going to show you now is, I'm going to jump now to Aboriginal people in Australia. So I, was, I never worked with them in Australia, I, I was fascinated by Malaysia. But this is a picture of a very, very old picture taken like over a hundred years ago of a ceremony, like a ritual of Australia's First Nations people in the centre of Australia, very isolated place, in the desert. And it just shows you the a picture of a, a very ancient way of thinking. Their thinking is, in a sense, the beginnings of humanity. It's the beginning of human thinking. 
because their thinking is, in one sense, it's kind of almost cosmic thinking. And it's, it's a long story to explain, but they are actually acting out, they're acting out a, what they call a dreaming story. They believe everyone comes out of this ancient time called dreaming, which is the same as when we dream at night. And people come out of this dreaming and we wake up and but in dreaming there are so many stories of what they call their ancestors. And their ancestors created the world. And their ancestors shaped the world. Everything in the world was made by ancestors. And their task is to, to sing the ancestors songs and dance the ancestors dance. And this is what they're doing. And by doing this, they are recreating the world. They're recreating, they're making the world again. It's extraordinary consciousness. And there's lots of strange pictures, and this is them dressing up, putting on decoration as they're acting out the dreaming. Now, and they actually have a kind of a diagram of this. And they actually believe that the world was formed from dreaming originally. We all came out of dreaming. And then we're, we step out and we wake up and we become an ordinary life happens out here. But ancient life is in dreaming. And every night they say we go back into this dreaming we explore and, and then in the morning we wake up again and we come back. And when we die, we go back into dreaming. And we live out in the landscape. We live in the earth, in the rocks and trees. And we live back in nature. And then, we're, and then when we're born again, we come out and we live, in, we live out in the wide world. But they believe that, uh, that by going through rituals and ceremonies, they're able to actually relive the dreaming time in ceremonies. And that's what they're doing when they dress up. Now, but they also have, most importantly, the dreaming gave them rules for living. Rules for living. And every person in their culture, every person in one particular what they call nation or tribe, every person in one of those, you belong, you're born into one group. And this is a map that they've drawn of all their groups. The men are the start with TJ and the women start with N. And they have incredibly strict rules on how you have to live. And most importantly, who you can marry. And in their whole society, everyone belongs to one of these groups. And these lines are what they call the marriage lines. You can only marry someone in the group opposite to you. So if you're a, say you're a, you're a Nangarai woman, you can only marry a Changala man. You have no choice. And if, you're, if I'm a Changala man, I can only marry a Nangala woman. And if I belong to this group, I can only marry someone from that group. Now it's laid down. Note, note, this is the first, and this is the first this is the Australian Aborigines. The reason I start with them is Australia's Aborigines are the oldest known culture on earth. Like we have evidence going right back. They're the oldest culture on earth. It goes back 60,000 years that we know there were people doing this in Australia. So the evidence is this is the first human way of thinking. This is step one. First form. Now, Rid of Starnas 
wrote some things about the evolution of the earth and it fits with that, which I won't go into now, but I'll just do it and I'll present you on this way. So these are the rules. You have to marry someone that so if you're if I'm a Changala man, I can only marry a Namurai woman. And all the others <coughs> forbidden. Seriously. They 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 now nah, and, and so and but all the time I'm mixing with all of these people. But this group, if I'm a Changala, I call the Namurai, they are my wives. I have to marry one of them. But I also call the other Namurai women, I call them wife as well. Mm. But I don't, I just marry that one. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the uh, Namurai women, they refer to the Changala men mm -hmm. as husbands. But you only marry one of them. Now the rules are so strict, and they were very fierce, that you could not break that rule. And if, if you did, you were killed. Serious as that. Yeah. It was that bad. It was that serious. So this was the first way of organizing life on earth. So it's both a spiritual idea and a social idea. So the spiritual idea made the social. They say this came from dreaming. So when people say, well, why do you have this system? Why do you have these? They say it came from dreaming. It was laid down by the ancestors. The ancestors told us. And that's why we keep doing it. Now even today, they, they have um, they keep some of this in some parts of the very isolated parts of Australia, right out in the desert. They still keep some of this going on. Many Aboriginal people have come to the city, they don't, you know, it's all been lost, but it's still there. And not only that, but, and look at this, it's even more complicated. Right? This is where children go. This is where children go. If I'm a Nangala woman, my children are Chapuljari. Huh? So if, I'm, if, 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 I'm, if I have a child, my child is not Nangala. My child is a Chapuljari or a Nangaljari. Which means the new generation will be named different from the exactly. other Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Mm. And then, my my, if I'm a, say I'm a Nangala woman, my child is a, is a Chapuljari. Her child, my grandchild, is a Nangarula. My great-grandchild is a Nangarati. But then my great-great-grandchild is back to me again. <laughs> if I live that long. <laughs> but then the other ones go the other way. Now this is exactly what the Aboriginal people wrote this down for us. But this is how they do it. So if you're, it goes like this. So, if, just say, if I'm a Changarai man, I marry a Nangala woman, a child is a Chapuljari, he has to marry a Nakamara woman, and their child is a Changarai again. My grandson is in my my group. Follow the father or the mother's side. It's two different sides. It's two different sides. So this is it following a male. So if my a Nangala woman, if my if my son is if I have a son, he's a Chapuljari. Right? If it's a daughter, if it's a daughter, uh, she she becomes a Nakaljari. But she has to, she has to, she also, the children go on a slightly different journey. It's very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Very, complicated. <laughs> very complicated. And it is, so, it, is so, it is so powerful thinking. It took white people a very, very long time to work this out. They need to hang a name tag here. Yeah, well, they do. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny thing. I, 
I teach this in, I do a, a main lesson in year 11. I teach this, and I make name tags. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all make different groups, and I say, no, you're going to marry that one. Oh. And across and then, and then, you do have to need a name tag, that's right. But they don't need name tags because they, they know it all. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary thing. They know it. They all grow up knowing that's their, it's their science, it's their history, it's their story. So that's the extraordinary thing. Now, so it becomes, so they have, everyone has a place. So if this is the, uh, this is how it all works. They, they know, everyone they see, they know who is their relative. So for example, if they then, um, these are, if you go around, they even have these lines are your mother's in law. <laughs> and they have, they have a rule that you're not allowed to speak to your mother-in-law. <laughs> Some people say this is very wise. <laughs> not only can't speak, you can't look at her. She can't look at you. So, so if they're in the camp, if they're in the camp, um, the mother-in-law appears, then you, you turn away. <laughs> so, so these are the negative ones. Now, what this means, what I'm coming to, the next slide up, the next slide is where they put all this together. And there is, you have a relationship with everyone that is set by the family. So if I'm, just say I'm a Changra man, my wife is a Nangala, my son is a Chapulchari. So this, this group, all these boys are my sons, and my sons and my nephews. These ones up here are also nephews. These ones up here, if you follow the, the, the mother's line, this one here is my grandmother. So I have a special relationship to them. And they work everything in groups. So all of the women in this group, one of them is my grandmother, but all of them, I feel towards them like they're all, they're all my grandmothers. And you know how you feel to your grandmother, you know, you feel very nice. So I have this very nice warm feeling to all of these. But these ones are, they're all, all of these are my mothers-in-law. <laughs> so I have quite a negative relationship to them. These ones, these ones are my daughters-in-law. So, um, so, so you, you have to look at it from one particular angle. These ones are my other nieces and nephews. Now when they put it all together, this is what it looks like. <laughs> this is this is their this is their this is their social universe. Oh. Oh. So if you have one, if you are here, you have a different relationship to every single person. But it's laid down by the dream. Oh. And, it's, okay. and it's, it tells you how you have to relate to them. There's no freedom. No. So it's all laid down. Now it works beautifully. And it has worked for 60,000 years. Wow. Amazing. Wow. So it's, it's worked well. In that, in that sense. And this is, our, this is our first human thinking. Sets of rules that we all sit within. Now, they also, as part of this, their consciousness, their thinking, is quite extraordinary. So they live in this very... Australian environment, which has this beautiful, well, it's, it's very harsh, it's very difficult where they mostly live now. The middle of Australia is just desert. Like you can't even farm there, it's just so barren, it's terrible. That's why we have a small population, same population as Malaysia, but we're spread out over this vast land. So, but the middle of it is this, this desert. But they see this very differently because they see all of this from a spiritual perspective. Mm. They see, in the landscape, they see their ancestors. All of this, their ancestors live in these, these stones and this desert. 
And each one of these was created by an ancestor who walked the earth and then at the end of dreaming went to sleep. And what we see there as a stone is actually his sleeping body. And they represent it through this extraordinary art that they have. They may have seen Aboriginal Australian art. It's quite extraordinary. And this is the way, this is a painting of that scene. It's like a map. They look down on it like a map. That's how they, they look down. But the world is totally connected to them. They are embedded in the world. So they live in the world and they are one totality. Now this is our first form of thinking. So I always start with this, just to give you a picture of the beginnings of the human journey, the beginnings of the, the human journey of, of thinking. This is the beginning, this is how it all began. Where we're embedded in the world. Now remember those who did the course, I did a, I have a little slide where we talk about the, the young child and their, their consciousness, their way of thinking. And if you remember, I talked about at the beginning of life, we are, we are totally, in a sense, embedded in the world. We really feel ourselves at one with the world. And I talked about this. We have the sense of the world and our self is one. We have the sense of being part of the world. Now, in humanity's story, this is that. It's this very beautiful beginning of the human story. So the First Nations peoples, they capture just, they're so perfect that they are embedded in the world. It's, 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 almost, it's so perfect in one sense, you don't want to leave. And that's the Australian, the Aboriginal people, they've, they've had that beautiful system for thousands and thousands of years. But gradually what happens, and we talked about how what happens with the child, is that we gradually start to separate out. And this happens with the child gradually over these first, about, it takes about the first nine years. If you remember in the course